early. I think we're early. It's 3.30. It's 3.30? Okay, yep. my watch is off. All right. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name's Ed Baldoff. This is John Griffith. And we're here to talk about the status of replication in Cinder. Um, I'm going to start for a bit, then we'll turn it over to John, and then uh, I'll take over again at the end. So, um, so the first kind of bit is why are we building replication into Cinder? Um, Basically, Cinder was a cloud native uh, storage application, and we're getting there's a lot of push to have uh, a DR backup capabilities in there, which are traditional enterprise uh, capabilities. So, um, if you're trying to put that app on in the cloud that that uh, that doesn't understand how to be cloudy, doesn't understand how to replicate at the application layer, uh, this is a way to to solve that. Uh, you'll notice in the slide here I have backup, kind of, because that's not really a good backup solution in replication, but it, it, it sort of kind of can be. Um, so in in looking at the problem, there's a number of use cases. Uh, there's a number of use cases, but we're going to talk about the limitations today to address a few limited cases. And then the challenge becomes different vendors, different terminologies, different ways of doing failover, fail back uh, with a replicated volume. Um, terminology, John will take you through some of that. And, and so um, the philosophy has been crawl, walk, run. But the first time we tried to walk, I think we fell down. <laughs> and John, again, will take us through that a little bit on, on why we have version one, why we have version two, um, and maybe version three at some point in time here. I don't know if you call them a different version. Uh, and then there's some other like hypothetical questions out there like should uh, it be aware of availability groups. Right now, it's not. So it's availability, gr availability groups are a Nova concept and not a Cinder concept today. But it's a concept out there in the cloud that you might want to say, I want to replicate this, and I just want to replicate it to somewhere outside of it, the current availability group. Um, but you, as an as a operator, you're going to have to manage that a little bit to start with until we answer that question somehow. I guess I should have had a question mark on that. So what use cases uh, did we consider as we're, as this was being built? Um, never two different vendor backends, right? So this is a vendor. There's been a couple sessions about our vendors killing Cinder, uh, or there was one yesterday. And this is one of those things where it's very, very vendor specific on how you do replication on the back end. Um, the other thing that we will talk about a little bit is there is no reference implementation. So in everything else we do in Cinder, uh, it needs to go into refer reference implementation first, the LVM uh, reference implementation. We, the community has not uh, figured out a good way and taken the time to get that uh, in there yet to, so we can test it. So there's some challenges around Until that. Until yesterday, right? as of yesterday, we have a plan. So we, Okay, now we have a plan. Yep. But um, No, it's not there yet. But we It's have not a plan. there, right, yep. right. So that's good. I was not in that session. So um, the questions were, you know, kind of the use cases considered two backends in the same cloud. Uh, does that make sense? Again, this comes into availability groups. Um, two backends in potentially a different cloud, federated identity. How does that all work? Um, two backends, one not in the cloud. That's another thing that we, you know, we do account for that today. Um, number one and three, we're accounting for. Uh, kind of two is a different discussion. Um, one to multiple backends. I think the code will accept that. I think we, I don't know how much testing has been done on that. Well, John will take you through the status of that in a little bit here in a minute. Um, automated versus non-automated failover. What is it, how do we determine, is it time to fail over, right? Is it, is, is there really a failure? Or is there some kind of transient failure that failing over? Because failing over is a pretty significant event. Um, uh, one of the things I don't have in here is consistency groups, right? If I fail over one volume out of a consistency group, now we can get in this weird state. So that's got to be accounted for. I don't know the status of that, but that Not was yet. one of the things we were discussing. Yeah. Um, if you've got one node, one volume failed over out of consistency group, what do you do? Uh, that's bad. So you got to fail them all over. And then, uh, you know, snapshot replication versus continuous replication. And how do you then promote the, the continuous replica to a consistent state? And there's a lot of things to consider in there. So, um, We've looked at those. We probably missed a few. If you got some situation, let us know, and we'll add it into the list to continue to consider. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John a little bit for kind of a history and where we're at today. So, All right. So uh, I kind of want to talk a little bit about you know what we've done in the past, uh, how we've got here. 
what some of the different thoughts in the community are um, and, and s some opinions. So I'm really good at sharing my opinions, whether you want to hear them or not. Um, but so what happened a while back was some folks came up uh, and, and had this, you know, one of the big features that storage vendors offer is replication. So obviously a number of vendors in the center community wanted to uh, expose replication as an API uh, that's available in Cinder and that they could do, so a feature that they could expose. Now, that all sounds well and good. Uh, the problem is, is there's different views on what OpenStack should be and whether it should do that or not, right? Um, so you've probably heard the different arguments about cloud native versus traditional, et cetera, et cetera. Should OpenStack try and replicate some of the things, replicate, oops, <laughs> should it try and duplicate and emulate some of the things that VMware does or not? Um, some people believe that it should, some people believe that it shouldn't. Um, personally, I'm kind of more in the camp that I don't think it should, but the reality is the users are usually uh, who makes a lot of these decisions and drives things in an open source community, right? So there is definitely a strong voice out there asking for volume replication inside of Cinder. Um, so we started moving forward with that. Um, and we kind of ran into some problems. Uh, and, and it's kind of predictable that we would. Replication is an interesting thing. Um, it's, it's a very complex thing. And it's something that every vendor that has it in their product does it differently. They have different semantics. They have different rules. Uh, they have different vocabulary, which makes it even worse, right? Um, so everybody does it differently. Everybody has different rules on how to do it. Um, and now you have Cinder, which is a project with a choice of over 70, 75 different backend devices that you can plug in. How do you get all of them to agree on an API, <laughs> right? Um, so the first proposal that came out was you don't, right? So don't put this in the API. Hide this under something like volume types and, and make it something that nobody actually sees, right? Um, leave it up to the admin and vendor unique things to do in the background and be done with it. So that wasn't very popular. Uh, so some folks went and they went ahead and they tried to implement a, a full-blown uh, solution. Um, did a great job, wrote some really cool code, uh, some really complex code. The problem was uh, we kind of got in a rush. So we went through a six month release cycle and we were getting close to the end of the cycle. Uh, the patch had been iterated over many, many times, reviewed many, many times. Um, and the problem that we ran into was people wanted it, they wanted it merged and they wanted it merged now. So we made a big mistake and we rushed it through, right? So the result was we went out the door with replication V1 and we only had one implementation in tree for one vendor. And it just so happened it was the vendor that wrote it. And it was a very complex piece of code. It was a very complex change. Uh, it had a, a number of API changes and things like that. Well, what happened shortly after that was a number of us, um, you know, came on board uh, during the next cycle and said, okay, I'm gonna write a version. I'm gonna do replication for my backend, everything else. And what we found is the semantics that we've been reviewing and working with and everything else all this time, as we actually started to dig deeper and try and implement this on our own devices, it was impossible, right? So it wouldn't work. We couldn't fit, we couldn't find a mechanism to make all of this fit and work for everybody. So we were kind of stuck and you know, we didn't really know what to do. Um, we went back and forth for a while. We made some different decisions, some different arguments. Um, the thing that we found was we didn't have good documentation on any of this at all. Uh, the one person who actually really understood it in depth was no longer really available, which created a significant problem. Um, and then back to the other thing is nobody was testing it. So that was a really big problem. The original one? So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I don't know. You. So, <laughs> so if you look at, for example, the Kilo release of OpenStack, 
you can go through, and I'm not going to call out, you know, the, the vendor or anything else, um, and look at the code, the replication code, and try and trace through it. Um, you'll kind of get an idea. It's 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 hard. It's hard to tell. I'm, I'm not exactly sure exactly how it's implemented, exactly how the configuration options work or anything else. Now, in, in fairness, um, if you were a customer of theirs, I will guarantee that they probably have really good documentation available for you, and they probably do some extensive testing, and it probably works great. But I do not have any answers on exact, uh, I don't have any insight to those things. Um, one of the things that, uh, about all of this, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that makes OpenStack pretty powerful and, and makes it really successful and work well is the fact that we are pretty strict and rigorous about our continuous integration, right? So every change that gets submitted into OpenStack and this Cinder or any other project, it goes through a pretty extensive set of automated tests. The problem is all of those tests are in a synthetic environment on a single node OpenStack cluster, right? It's not really a cluster, right? So you start doing things like replication and you have two problems. One is, as Ed mentioned, there's no replication in the reference implementation, so it doesn't get tested. The other problem, there are no multi-node OpenStack deployments in the gate. So there's no way to actually test it anyway, right? So there's zero testing uh, from the OpenStack community perspective, which creates a significant problem. So we started uh, at the beginning of the L release. Uh, at the last summit in Vancouver, I had a big rant and little temper tantrum and everything else about what was going on. And um, everybody said, well, yeah, why don't you do something about it? And, so I did. <laughs> um, so V2, what we did is we all got together and we said, all right, look, this doesn't work. Um, what we have uh, is, is it may be great for, for a small set of customers, but it's not good for everybody. So we need to work together um, and come up with a solution that will work for everybody and make sure we're all on board and we all agree and, and things are good. So. We did a really good job at the start, right? So we spent quite a bit of time at the summit and quite a bit of time over IRC and things like that for the, for the first few weeks after the summit, um, collecting ideas, uh, you know, con talking about different things and everything else. And then it was time to actually write the spec, right? So we write this spec and everybody starts reviewing it. And the beautiful thing <laughs> about that was it took three and a half, I think four months to get everybody to finally agree on the spec. So the specification to do this was iterated over more than 60 times before everybody could agree, right? So it was just crazy. It was ridiculous. And it went from no API calls and just volume types to a handful of API calls and volume types to no volume types and then back to a mixture and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We finally got to a point where we said, okay, here's the deal. At the mid-cycle meetup in Fort Collins last summer, we said, we either agree on this and merge it now or we kick it all out and we don't do this, period. Well, lo and behold, plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two. <laughs> All of a sudden it merged, so we were good. So we went ahead and we wrote the code, we implemented it. We implemented um, all of the bits and pieces that were needed in the core Cinder code. Uh, and it was good. We were, you know, we were feeling pretty good. Everybody was pretty happy and, and we thought things were good. But the problem was is we were in this mode again where we were now two weeks out, three weeks out from cutting the release candidate for Liberty. So while there were a number of folks that had been working in parallel and had some things ready in a driver that they wanted to release, we made the decision that, hey, you know what? Let's not make the same mistake we made again, right? So what you have right now is you have all this code in Cinder that talks about replication, but there's no implementation anywhere in Liberty to use it, right? Um, I think it's better that we wait and, and get that solidified and everything else rather than release something that's not ready yet. And as it turns out, 
now that the uh, M release has opened up and people are submitting code against it and, and doing reviews and digging deeper, we're finding a number of things that we're changing in the API. Had we released that and done that, we wouldn't be allowed to do that because you can't make an API change like that. So. Okay, thanks, John. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of kind of how it's going to work. Uh, we have some prototype implementations. Uh, John's got ours to a pro what I call a prototype stage. So I've, I then took it and tried to make it work. And so here's what, uh, what happened, right? So um, first off, the driver has to do its part, and it has to re report that replication enabled is true. So that's a pretty easy change in the driver. Uh, you as a operator have to change the config file. So there's a fairly complicated... Uh, line, it's, it's, it's a single line, but it winds up being multiple lines in the, the config variable called replication device. You can see here the, the proper semantics of how that works. Um, I'll take you through a, uh, an example here, which will be more descriptive. Um, I'm just looking at my note here at the bottom and my, my detail above it, and I have a comma at the end of there, which I'm not supposed to have. So <laughs> right, that, does, that, that does make it not work. <laughs> so, um, so in the example, which is here, I left off the comma. Um, <laughs> so this is the example config file from the setup I did, and we have a little demo. Uh, I didn't, I'm not gonna try to do it live because we all know how those work, but I do have a video of this at the end. So you set up the first uh, solid fire here, solid fire one, that's the normal um, config stanza that you put in the config file. The second one is the device that's the source. So you could have these um, cross replicate, but I set this up just as a one way. So solid fire two is gonna replicate to solid fire one. Um, you can see that the uh, men's replication target equals true. That's the thing that enables it. And then replication device points to that solid fire one above there. Um, in our case, the vendor specific ID here is the actual name of the cluster. So you'll see in the demo that the cluster was called Wolverine after uh, a comic book character. And that's what we use in there. Um, you'll also notice that the admin, uh, the login and the password have to be repeated down below in that second stanza. Um, John's going to work on figuring out how to fix that, but for now that has to be there on how to log into that. Now this is, um, uh, it's interesting. So the managed replication target equals true. Um, that tells us that the destination is actually managed by the cloud. So we're, the, the cloud will see both the ID show up in both uh, devices. If that's false, um, that actually then is the replicate to a device that's not in the cloud anywhere. So that's the second use case, right? In, so not to, I hate to interrupt. No, but, that's fine. Um, one thing, just so you know, when you look at the code, you'll notice that's not there anymore. So one of the things that we did change and fix okay. up is you don't have to do that anymore, okay. which is a pretty big deal. So it's kind it's, of redundant. As you can sort of tell, this is in flux, right? Yep. Uh, he's changed it a bunch since since I did this. and Crawl, walk, I, run. I found some, some <laughs> issues that have been fixed. So. Um, and then you set up volume types, and there's a couple keywords in here. Uh, every vendor can have their own uh, so set of set of things in here. So um, the big one is replication enabled. This is just uh, you can set up a volume type, uh, not give it a keyword of replication enabled. You could put all the other things in there that you needed, and it would not go. Um, but you need that, and then you can set up uh, replication type async sync number of replicas. There's a whole bunch of other ones of these that will be documented by each vendor. Uh, these are the three that so far are in the code that are standard, uh, kind of makes sense, but there's going to be, you're going to have to read the vendor documentation for this. So we'll probably have to make sure we go through and get the documentation good. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff, and I actually, I'm going to ask you a question. Can you comment on the status of the V1 and V2 code in the tree yeah. and how those two are going to interact? And then we'll talk so, about this So it's an interesting problem. The, the first proposal was, hey, let's take all this V1 stuff and just rip it out, get rid of it, right? Because um, it's actually uh, a little bit cumbersome and a little bit confusing. Uh, but the problem is there are probably a couple of people using it. Um, as a result, there it lives and it doesn't go away. So what we have done is we have put markers around the V2 versus the V1 uh, methods. Um, in addition, we will be putting a uh, deprecation marker on the V1 methods. So at least for another year, they'll be there, but they will report and say, hey, these are deprecated and they don't apply, right? Or who knows, maybe somebody will decide to make these work for V2 at some point, but right now they don't. Uh, so uh, this is actually not a complete list. Um, there are at least two or three others uh, that I can think of, uh, but more importantly, there's also a bunch of code that does a bunch of funny things for replication in V1. 
uh, that is scattered all throughout the sender code base um, that is going to be tricky to make go away. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like these two came up when I was looking through the code and I was like, hey, you know, John, make sure. To, and he's like, no, those are V1 semantics. So I put them in the slide. There's a bunch more. But these, so if you see promote and re-enable, um, I don't actually know what these do either. That's why I was asking John. And, and Neither does not, the guy that wrote them. <laughs> Neither does the guy that wrote them. Okay, so this is, so if you see Just these kidding. things Just and kidding. you see this, this is the V1 semantic, it's not uh, V2. So current terms, um, Enabled, disabled, these are a little more descriptive. Uh, statuses, disabled, inactive, active, active stopped. Have these changed at all since uh, uh, I wrote this slide? No, but I suspect they will. Okay. To be um, honest. And then there's like there's four admin tasks. So these are the uh, the, the bits that you're gonna actually do as an admin. You're gonna um, you know enable replication, disable. These are admin tasks. So if you're gonna take the other the, the destination array down for some reason, you can stop uh, all all replication to it as a cinder command. Um, you can re-enable it. Uh, if you had a failover as an admin, you can force that failover. Uh, I think we're going to do some of these on per volume basis too. So this is somewhat to be worked out. Um, and then list replication targets. So there, there's there uh, just a second. so there's some discussion on some of these as well. Um, <laughs> things like uh, replication failover and things like that, and having that as a command. Um, there's some of us that think that. That's not necessarily something that we want to expose. Uh, that replication should be, hey, you ask this volume to be replicated, and it's replicated. If something happens and something goes wrong, um, that's a pretty serious thing. And you probably don't want magic to happen in the background, right? You're probably going to want your cloud administrator to actually figure out what's going on and fix things and put them back in a state that they should be in. Um, if you have these things silently happening in the background, it could actually lead to a really serious problem in the long run. Um, so there's some discussion on the value of these things. Um, however, one valid point that's been brought up is how do I test that this is working? And the only way to test that this is working, well, not the only way, but an easy way to test this is working is to have those commands and, and expose them to the admin. So you had a Good. question? So It depends on the back end. For yeah. some back ends it is, for some back ends it's not, right? So in, in our case, yes, you can have multiple replication targets. For other back ends, you can't. Uh, the, the other problem, and one of the reasons why things like this are hard, is there are some back end devices that don't really support replication at all. So we put forth a massive amount of effort and work for something that only works for five or six you know, different products, right? Yeah. So actually that leads right to the next question. So here's the, as I understand it, the state of the drivers that are in work or uh, are going to be in progress. Um, the first four are up there um, in some state that you could get a hold of today. They're in review, they're in code, they're in tree somewhere. Uh, I talked to the, the, and I, Adele, I might have to move above or below the line here, but I talked to the EMC and the NetApp folks uh, today, and they're both uh, planning to do this, and it's going to be in Mitaka or Mitaka, uh, but they have not submitted them for review yet. So uh, is Sean in the audience? I don't think he is. So I don't know where. The Dell, I'll have to see where we're at. They're them. in progress. I've been talking to them. Is it in it's review? It's not up in review yet, yep. but they okay. are working on it. The so they're below the line, but soon to be above the line. Yep. So uh, let's see if we can get this demo to work here. Um, uh, it's going to come up. All right, cool. So again, let me just pause it for a second. Uh, it's, it's, of course, not live. It's Memorex. Uh, is it showing up there? Okay. So I'm going to go through here a little bit, and uh, I'm going to pause this as we go. You can see here I've, I've just looking at the um, – what's it doing now? Uh, there we go. Oh, whoa, whoa. That's now you've done now it. Now I've done it. Hang on. Let me get to this slide again. start it and then use the space bar instead. Okay. Is that so big enough? Can everybody see that okay? The font big enough? 
Is the font? Yeah, it, it, I get it a little bigger here, I think, in a second. But that's the, there's the config file. It's basically the same config file you saw on this slide. Uh, just kind of catting it to look through or look around at it there. Um, you'll notice in this, if you can see it, I did um, use the target uh, name of Wolverine in there. Um, that's just a, a name we internally. That's, again, a, it's a required field but it's um, dependent on the, the vendor. So we use the cluster name. Just so you know what that's used for is that's so that your driver actually knows how to identify and contact the target backend that it needs, right? So for some vendors that may be a UUID, it may be an IP address, it may be something else. For us, we use a cluster name. So yep. that's a unique thing for us. Yep. So. Oh, it's doing it again. Damn it all. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the demo gods don't. Uh, it's should have done it live. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those things where I keep I'm I'm clicking on the. Let's just do it from here. Just don't pause and you'll be okay. All right, hang on. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go the other way and just pull up the video here. Hang on. Where is it? Uh, what folder did I put it in? This is why I put it in there. Here we go. Right here. My eyes are going. All right, there we go. We'll make it bigger. Don't don't raise any attention to that. There this is go. all being recorded, you know. Okay. Now we can use the space bar. Okay. So, as the video goes through, we'll highlight it. There's the the source, the destination. There's the replica device highlighted. This is um, the default, which is which is one, one, right? So we're just we're going from Solid Fire one to Solid Fire two in this example here. So the the way that works now, um, if you were if you were to have multiple replication targets, um, what you would do is that replication device equals line, you would duplicate that line with another right. entry, and you would just continue on for however many you wanted. And then you can set in the volume type so it'll go to one. Yep. It'll and then in one the, so in all. our case, for example, if you had four of them set, if you set in the volume type, you had one type that was replication count one, it would only pick one of those. If you said three, it would pick three, four, whatever you say, yep. uh, until the number of devices you have configured. Yep. Okay. So move along here. Um, just, I'm kind of go. So this is our API. We're gonna look just, you know, point out a couple things here. Um, you can see in the uh, the cluster uh, replica targets here, and there's the settings. There's there's the Wolverine, and that's how you can see that those two are paired up. Um, the driver will actually automatically create the pairing if it's not there, but uh, if it's there, it will use the pairing that exists. Um, so now we'll we'll kill out of that uh, VI session, and then here we'll go through and we'll. Uh, do a listing of the cinder types, um, basically to see that there's these are non-replica cinder types. Uh, then we're going to go through here and create a couple of this one called SolidFire REPL, SF REPL, uh, and then set up the uh, the extra specs here. So cinder extra specs list to show that there's none there, and then um, create the keys. So the first thing, so you'll notice I have multi backend set up here. So I have an LVM and I have solid fire. Um, I'm going to need to not only set up the replication, but I'm also going to have to push this to the volume backend. So that's the volume backend name that I created there. Um, and then this is the set up the replica replication enable flag here. Um, and it's an interesting syntax there. So yes, it is quote and is true. I don't know who wrote that. So um, the reason it's that way is I was told that I could not merge the code unless I changed it. So it okay. used to be just true, uh, but there's a number of people that are diehards on how this should be. And the is true and is false for Boolean representation is now a requirement. So. Okay. So now you'll see that I've fl flipped over here to Horizon. Um, I try to kind of go back and forth. Horizon's a little bit better for demos, uh, easier to show. So you can see that the SolidFire replication uh, type comes in here. Um, uh, we're gonna. You, so you could have set those up through Horizon if you wanted to. I, I did it through the command line just to show that it's there. Um, and then I'm gonna go create the. Uh, uh, I can't remember. I think I created through Horizon here. So we'll create the volume. Um, 
from Horizon. It's just a pull down now, and you can make it a replication type. Obviously, as you're, if you're an operator, you might have a little more descriptive description in there, not just it's replicated, but it's you know this is between Virginia and Colorado or something like that. But uh, you can see here, you pull that down. Um, so, so one thing that's cool about this, uh, the way this is implemented now, too, to keep in mind, is um, the way it's written, it doesn't break or impact any of the existing volume type stuff that you use. So what that means is you may have a volume type with certain extra specs in it, whether that be QoS settings, thin provisioning, whatever it might be. That stuff all still works. So what you can do is now you can just supplement that with replication information, and things still work the same way. The old code that wasn't quite true so um, so that's kind of a big deal and it's it may not seem like a big deal but it's it's pretty cool okay uh, but, uh, during the replication will you bypass any QRS settings you have on this floor? nope no no really that that's what I, that was my point right yep. so if if you wanted to actually set QoS settings on that on that volume as well as replicate it absolutely yeah you can I do didn't that happen too. to do that here I just you know sure, I, what I mean is when the replication actually takes place will you respect the QoS yes okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. In our case, so he knows he's familiar with with solid fire and QoS. Yeah. So yeah, right. yep. And again, that's another vendor specific. Thing. So you see, you're starting to see a lot of the vendor specific bits of this coming out, and that's the challenge, right? So, so you can see here it creates the volume, um, and it's available. And now we'll, I, I'm going to do a couple things down here. I guess I got to make that go away there. Um, you're going to hide it under the player bar. Yeah, we'll <laughs> make that go oh, away. So. I switch over, I did this under demo, so you can see um, it's there, and then we'll do a show, and you can see the details here of, um, and then replication status comes up in the details of the volume. So it's there, and it's enabled, and it's going. Uh, the demo here is then going to walk us through looking at the, the solid fire GUI here to see um, the volume. Um, actually go through and pull this off. We, we have an account for each thing, so I can filter the volumes by account. And you can see it's red right there. That means it's, it's, uh, replicate, it's started the replication process, but it hasn't synced up yet. So um, it's going through. This is on the other cluster here. So this is on the, the, the destination. And you can see it's red. And then by the powers of um, demo video gods, we can make this go faster. <laughs> so you'll see it goes to uh, this resuming connected, and then it goes to a different state. Uh, here to um, give it a second and it'll I sped this up so it'll get there but this is all dependent this is another thing that's dependent on the, the how the back end does that stuff and what states it goes through and, and, and things like that so um, that doesn't come up into OpenStack at this point in time to see what the, those statuses are yeah so so we do actually um, the good thing is is we do do that now um, okay. So, so it, it took us a while to figure out, or took me a while to figure out how I wanted to do it. But what we do now is we actually have a um, periodic task that the driver reports a status back up and, yeah. and tells it what that is. Um, I don't think that's a good solution long term, but that's what we have for now. So. Yeah. Have you implemented that in our driver yet? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, All right. I have. So, yeah, so so the the driver, a driver that or a back end driver that implements this, um, there's now a method that they're expected to implement that will actually report the status back up to the volume manager, and the volume manager can then update the database. Nope, nope, does not. Well, uh, is there a way to notify volume manager if the back end has some limitations as to okay, we cannot. So, so this is where things get really interesting, right? This is where, where the fun begins. And this is one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of having this, <laughs> this in the APIs at all. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different limitations depending on what your back end is, right? And it, and it creates some really serious problems. Um, one of the biggest problems in an OpenStack cloud, in my opinion, is you know our whole goal was we want to abstract all that messiness on the back end away, right? And what we're doing now is we're starting to expose more and more of it, you know, which isn't what we were supposed to do. And so the question becomes, is that an admin thing that you want to show it to the admin? Or do you want to show it to yeah. the user? Because then the user is going to be calling yep. into the cloud manager going, is this right? Is right. this normal? How long does this take? All those kinds of and, things. And so that's the next thing. So what we've done right now is we have limited all of that visibility and everything. It is admin only. So an end user 
that, that is using your cloud has no visibility into any of this whatsoever. So as far as they're concerned, you know, you could implement rsync as your replication on the background as far as they know. Um, we're not exposing any of that information to the end user. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll leave it that way, right? Because I don't think there's any reason why the end user should know. You can give them a volume type and call it replication and give it a description and everything else. That's fine. But I don't think there's any reason to expose the details of what's happening on the back end to them. Right. The sure. Yep. Yep. So we're going to go over. So, so yeah, like a typical workload would be, you know, for a database, for example, you put the database in hot backup mode, you flush the disk, you do a snapshot, then you replicate that. Is that in it accounted for in this, or is that kind of, is that beyond crawl? <laughs> uh, that's so it's beyond crawl. Okay. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's probably that's probably halfway through walk, in my yeah. opinion. Okay. Um, so my goal here was in, in the Mataka release, right, the upcoming release, to have a stable foundation that people can actually start using and experimenting with and figure out what the next steps are. Um, so all things in OpenStack, in my opinion, it, a great way to do it is you start really small and simple and then build on top of that. And, and where, where you're talking about, that is exactly the vision a lot of people have for this. Um, how long it takes to get there, that's tough to say. So I think there's a question over on this side of the room somewhere. No? The, we're, we're open for questions. So I got one in the back. I'll take the gentleman back there, and I, I got one up here. I was just wondering, how did you get around the issue you mentioned with the CI server testing? Is this now included? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's uh, one of the challenges still to be worked out. I mean, we haven't. So, uh, we have yeah, a, we do well, have, they have a plan. plan for a Reference implementation, reference implementation, but we also now all have to build CI systems where, and so this just yeah. doubles the number of CI systems we need to have, right? So yeah. So, so there's a couple of things on that. Um, in in my specific case, I have an external test set that I'm going to attach onto the existing CI runs that I do, and actually run this test on a periodic basis. I probably won't do it for every single commit, but I will do it periodic to start, um, just because tying up all the resources is kind of a pain. Um, long term, uh, we do have some things that I'm working with some folks from Linbit to do DRBD for the reference implementation. So that will give us the ability to do replication for LVM for the reference driver. And at the same time, in parallel, there's a number of folks working really hard to get multi-node tests in the gate, in the OpenStack gate. So once all that stuff's in place, we'll be able to start turning all that stuff on and then it'll just be part of the standard process. So we're not there yet, um, but we, we are actually getting there and making the right moves to actually do this correctly this time. So, Question up here with the microphone. Yeah, question on the, can you explain how the failback will work, but yeah. also <laughs> yeah. in, when you uh, have multiple targets, how the failback will work? So this is the problem, right? And again, this, this is where everything gets so fun and interesting. Um, there's a number of ways you can do this. Uh, if you want to implement automatic failback uh, and you have a replication setup that is a managed cluster to a managed cluster, right? It's a little bit easier because failover in that case, what you can do is you can do things like say, hey, all right, Cinder, I just want you to change the database column for this volume and point it to the other back end, right? So you can do some magic and kind of make things work and, and, and that's okay. Now when you start talking about bouncing back and forth, there's, it turns out, which I thought, oh yeah, well why wouldn't you? It's just a toggle and you just go back and forth. Yeah, guess what? Most back ends can't do that. So most back ends, you might be able to fail over once, but you cannot go back. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting things that happen there. And then the multi, the multi node. If I'm going n way, how, where do I, how do I pick who I fail yeah, over to? Which one, right? Yeah. So now you need Zookeeper or something to figure out. Well, and that, or that's an admin <laughs> function where the admin goes, oh, this data, this data center failed, and that means our next thing was we fail yeah. over to that one. And if that one's having a problem, then we go to the third one this, or something like that. I, I yeah. think all of, and this is really why I, I strongly believe that that all of the failover type functionality and stuff like that. I think that's something that 
in in a in a situation like OpenStack where you have all these different choices and everything else, that probably needs to be human intervention, right? Either that, or we need a mechanism that each vendor that implements this has their own individual plugin that they can submit and and do what they want and automate it for their customers if they choose to. But from a cinder's commu a, a community cinder perspective, I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to actually solve all of these problems for. 80 different solutions. Yeah. Next question all up right, here in so front. So add on to his question, I do not remember seeing it, but is there any test failover API available? First question, second question, is this synchronous replication? Is it like transparent failover so, which is happening? So two things about that. Um, so the first question was uh, about a test failover, yeah. and that's what that failover API command is there for. Yeah. It's there for the admin to go ahead and, and force a failover to test it, right? Not that's what it's for. Not not you know, not test test, but here like, I can yeah, force the failover. Make sure that the connections are there and yep. And make sure it actually works, right? right? So you can actually test it out and see if it works. So it'll actually It's gonna move it. It'll okay. actually move it. Yeah. It's gonna move it. it it'll okay. actually simulate breaking the the, the source cluster or the and source back end. Alright, so and are there any additional steps need to be taken from NOAA perspective or from Cinder perspective after the failover is complete? Yeah, as a matter yeah. of fact. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. So the thing that you have to remember what's going to happen is you were, if, for example, if you have a Nova instance running and attached to a volume, uh -huh. right, or if it was a boot from volume, um, you had an iSCSI connection to that device, right, and now all of a sudden that device isn't valid anymore. It's not there. So you're still going to lose that instance. It's still going to die. Um, and it's probably going to die a pretty horrible death. Um, <laughs> and bad things are going to happen. <laughs> so That's good though. I right. want it to just transparently right. and, and honestly, but this is there, also there are a number of people that want that. No, it, it's <laughs> they think exactly. they want that, right? That's this I'm is why you. this is an admin command or this is a script of some kind at a higher level that then goes through and restarts the services. Okay, it had a failure. We're moved over to the other side, start everything back up, and, and re. And it's a DR scenario, right? It's a disaster. You run your, your disaster run brook, and you're now pointed to the other side. So it's not just automatic and it's over. It, and so you had a second question. So it's not transparent failover, it's not synchronous replication. Candy. No, well, it is. So, so here's the thing. Depending on the back end, and I'm sorry, did yeah, you want to take it? Go ahead. You're so good. depending on the back end, it can be synchronous or asynchronous. So, so a number of us, and I think you guys as well, right? You can pick either one, right? The, the point is, from an orchestration perspective, when you're using the volume, uh, just because you're replicating and you can fail over, depending on how you define fail over, just because you're replicating, there's no magic. Right, so there's nothing that all of a sudden just makes the the new volume uh, or the target volume all of a sudden appear in the right place and you never hiccup or anything like that. So yeah. does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Back so to this, the question. This is very much a DR scenario. Right. It's back not to the a question about database. You know, obviously you might want to snapshot it and have that. And so there's a whole bunch of how does that? You know, you could synchronously replicate, but then you got a non-consistent. Destination. So. That's another six months worth of work. Or, or more. <laughs> yeah. So we'll take the question in the back. I've got. I saw another hand over here. Where was that other hand? Uh, so, is it possible to implement uh, volume replication using Cumulus Zone Mirror feature? Then it can uh, let the the backend which lacks of uh, volume replication have the same function. Could do that. There's nothing in this that would preclude the driver doing a breaking the mirror and then just pointing to a different part of the array, right? I mean, it wasn't the original intention, but I don't think there's anything that would prevent that, right? So if, I'm not sure I'm following, um, but I, I think what you need is one missing piece and that would be a multi-attached to have it attached to a, right. a, a, another component, right? So in the multi-attached hopefully will land on the Nova side sometime in the coming weeks. And I think when that's there, I think your that's scenario would actually work, and it would probably work fairly well. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, I, that's probably. I better. think I'm not positive. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, okay. don't hold me to it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I thought I saw another hand over here, and maybe a hand over there. Uh, anybody? One up here. I got. Let's. We're gonna go with her first. Sorry. Okay. I want uh, to understand the scenario that uh, if. 
Previously, I have three replicas or three replications, and one of the replica uh, now go uh, now die, uh, so goes offline. So now you have two replications only, but you want to keep rep the replications uh, still be three. So what what's the procedure to recompose it? Yeah. So right now, what what I do right now is I say you are now in. Uh, replication state error, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the future, ideally, what I would do is I would create another replication target automatically for you. Um, the problem is you can go down this path for a really long time, right? Um, there's definitely value in it, and, and it would be a cool thing to do. The problem is, is as I start writing this code and doing these things, I find out that, oh my gosh, I've got to do that for this corner case over here, and this one over here, and this one over here. And the next thing you know, I have 1,500 lines of code just to do this stupid replication thing, which <laughs> is just, it gets crazy, right? So at some point, I think we need to figure out and, and decide where do we draw the line, right? Where are we giving people um, a good, not a great, not a perfect, but we're giving them a good DR solution that's usable and, and protects them versus trying to be something that we're really not. And, and when I say we, I mean the OpenStack pieces. Right. Last question. Yep. That, that's honestly, that's my opinion. I, I, but I am finding that that's not acceptable to some people, right? Um, but yeah, you're right. We're gonna take one last question. I think we're out of time, or probably over time, but go ahead. Just, just a quick one. Uh, I was gonna ask, do you know um, where the, the Ceph guys are in terms of this, if they're working on implementing this in their back end? That's actually a really interesting question. Well, yeah, well, well Ceph has, not, they have RBD marrying, and they have some other things to do replication type things as well. Um, but the, but the question, right, right. yeah, exactly. Right. So the, the question, well, I, I was thinking your question was, are they doing anything in the Cinder code base right, right now? Right, right. Yeah. That, that I have not seen uh, yeah. or heard that they're doing anything. However, keep in mind, it is early in Mataka, uh, and, and there are quite a few people that work on RBD. So I, I would imagine that, that they will probably do something. Or maybe they're like me, and they just don't want to, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll wrap it up because I believe we're out of time. Uh, we'll be up here for a bit. For Thank a you, everyone. Thanks.